everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Um, I'm happy to be here and uh, talking about this subject of bracing for knee hypertension. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. There's very little literature available in, in the national databases of medical literature on, on knee hypertension. I've, did, I've done a lot of research and, um, and not much at all comes up. So we're going to just start about, uh, we did find some data that's out there. We'll talk about some of the, the data uh, dealing with this issue. We'll talk a little bit about anatomy and uh, some of the muscles that, that are usually involved with knee hypertension, the causes, what happens, and then conditions and supports. So we'll, we'll show you different levels of knee hypertension and different types of supports that may be appropriate uh, for any one individual. So with that, um, let me move this out of the way here a little bit. There we go. Um, this is a, a study that was presented at the 2017 Muscular Dystrophy Association meeting. And um, they uh, presented on the impact of FSHD and uh, uh, included in the findings were leg and, and foot weakness, very much 58%, moderately 22%. Obviously that's a, a big chunk of individuals who have those issues and fatigue probably very much related to this weakness. Uh, so it's uh, undoubtedly a significant issue. Um, then uh, at that same meeting, uh, they presented the challenges due to foot ankle or foot drop or ankle weakness. And uh, you can read the list. You're probably familiar with all these kinds of issues. Uh, and trips and falls is one of the big ones dealing with, uh, with foot drop. And it's interesting to me that the specific subject of knee hypertension did not come up on this list. Uh, so I, I know it's a big issue. I, I know the FSHD Society uh, receives a lot of questions um, about uh, knee hypertension, uh, but interestingly, it didn't make this, it didn't specifically make this list. Uh, in a, a journal uh, a publication in the journal Neurology published by Hamill, in 2019, uh, she, and, uh, excuse me, I gotta move this little window here again. Um, they listed fatigue and limitations with mobility and walking as, as some of the issues relating to FSHD uh, and, and the impact uh, that that condition has on individuals. And it was interesting to me that 100% of the people who are unemployed uh, indicated limitations in mobility and walking along with other issues, uh, obviously these all, these all add up to more than 100%, but there are multiple issues, but 100% of the people who were unemployed uh, cited limitations in mobility and walking. So it's a big, big deal. Um, and again, as, as significant as it is, I'm very surprised how very little uh, there is in literature regarding knee hyperextension, the causes of it, how to manage it. And so we're going to rely just on um, on uh, the clinical experience that I have and, and uh, what we've learned over the, over the years. So in spite of the data, or in spite of the lack of data, we know that, um, that there's muscle weakness involved with the diagnosis of CMT, uh, with, uh, with um, muscular dystrophy. Uh, that muscle weakness leads to knee hyperextension. We'll talk specifically what muscles are involved. And knee hyperextension leads to the medical definition of genu bottom which is knee hyperextension, the knee bending backwards instead of forward. And so there's a situation of knee hyperextension. Uh, there's a little bit more. Uh, generally, anything over 35 degrees or so is considered very, very significant. Um, anything uh, up to five degrees is considered very minimal. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we go through the program here. Uh, so just anatomy, I don't need to tell you what the femur is, that's the thigh bone, the patella is the kneecap, the tibia is the shin bone, and the fibula over here is kind of a strut that helps support the shin bone. Uh, that's a non-moving joint between those two bones there, by the way, for what that's worth. So those are the primary bones that are involved. Articulating cartilage is usually not involved as an issue uh, with this condition. Uh, so th that's the primary synovial membrane there. And then on the top of the tibia, uh, referred to as the tibia plateau as a meniscus. That's also cartilage, but it's, it's in the form of, it shapes a little bit of a cup. So this round head of the femur uh, has something to engage into on this uh, flat tibial plateau here. 
So uh, that cartilage helps the knee articulate, uh, helps the tibia articulate on the femur. Um, ligaments, uh, the uh, medial collateral ligament uh, is uh, probably the first ligament to go if, if the ligament is gonna be injured in the knee. It's usually one of the first ones to go, the lateral collateral. Uh, and we know that's the lateral or the outside because there's the, the um, uh, fibula. So that's the outside of the knee. Then in the middle of the knee between these two notches here, between these two condyles, is the anterior cruciate. That's one that's um, often injured in sports. And a disruption to that ligament can actually lead to knee hyperextension. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, the one that's always involved with knee hyperextension, the ligament that's supposed to stop knee hyperextension is the posterior cruciate ligament. It's this ligament tucked way back in here. Uh, they're referred to as cruciate ligaments because they cross. The anterior and the posterior cross like this. So they're referred to as cruciate ligaments. Uh, if an individual is involved with knee hyperextension, that ligament has been stretched out uh, to some degree or another. So it's always involved. Here's a, just a close up on that posterior cruciate, and it shows that, that, uh, ligament, uh, that, uh, that ligament being uh, disrupted. Uh, that may not and probably isn't the case with uh, knee hyperextension, uh, but it, it, uh, ligaments uh, adaptively stretch if they have too much stress put on them. They adaptively lengthen, and so uh, that's what happens is this, this ligament just gets lengthened because of undue stress on that ligament. As far as muscles and quadriceps, uh, weak quadriceps can lead to knee hypertension, and that's a pretty simple, um, pretty simple uh, explanation. When we walk, when the foot hits the floor, the knee's supposed to bend forward, and that's the big shock absorber in the body. And so um, if the quadriceps become weak, they, they, they know they're weak, so they won't allow the knee to flex forward, and they'll tend to lock the knee in extension. When the foot hits the floor, that locked extension position drives the knee into hyperextension. So weak quadriceps can lead to um, uh, the, the impact creating knee hyperextension. That's the same reason why that anterior cruciate ligament, the one, the ligament going this way, if it's weak or disrupted, the knee senses that weakness and it will tend to not allow the forward bending of the knee or knee flexion. And it tends to lock the knee more towards extension. And when the foot hits the floor, it drives the knee into hyperextension in the wrong direction. So quadriceps can be involved as a causative factor for knee hyperextension. Uh, if someone wanted to do some exercises to, to delay when knee hyperextension is gonna occur or to try and prevent it, uh, one of the things you could do is just do some baby squats. Uh, baby squats is defined as standing with your feet about shoulder width apart, uh, keep your heels on the floor, and just bend your knees ever so much. Stay safe. Um, uh, obviously, don't, you don't want to end up on a pile on the floor, uh, but bend your knees to a point where you're starting to feel some stress in your quads, and then straighten your knees back up. And then just keep doing these baby squats. Keep your trunk relatively more upright while you're doing this. Um, and, uh, and you'll really give a, a good workout to those quads. Um, there's uh, some discussion in literature, obviously, that can, they can be overstressed for individuals with neuromuscular conditions. So keep it well within your capacity, uh, but, uh, but trying to keep that knee bending forward uh, and just maybe three or four inches is all you need to put a little bit of stress on that quadricep to help it stay more active. Uh, hamstrings are in the back part of the thigh. Uh, they are usually not involved with the condition of knee hyperextension. The calf group is definitely involved with knee hyperextension. During walking, um, normally the knee is flexed a little bit. As the body moves over the foot that's on the ground, the gastrocnemius muscle right in here. It's the one right underneath the skin. It has two bellies, uh, that, that big calf muscle right underneath the skin is the muscle that prevents knee hyperextension, or is supposed to. If the gastrocnemius muscle here is weak, uh, the knee very much will have a tendency to have uncontrolled extension, which leads to knee hyperextension. So we see that in any number of neuromuscular diseases or conditions. Um, so um, uh, exercise the calf group, uh, just to stand and do heel rises. Uh, is a good way uh, to, to exercise that group. 
Uh, make sure your knee is in relatively towards extension as you exercise that. Uh, believe it or not, doing that baby squat we talked about for the quads will also exercise this muscle right here, the gastrocnemius. And so um, uh, for exercising, uh, that's, that's probably one you want to, want to hit very much. Then the anterior tibialis, that's the primary muscle that leads to, that picks the foot up during swing, uh, during swing phase of gait. So if that muscle is deficit, then a person tends to have foot drop and uh, they can't pick their foot up during swing very well. So uh, actually all of these muscles are involved except the hamstrings are probably not real, all that involved with knee hyperextension. So there's a normal knee, and I probably don't need to tell you what, knee, what Jenny Rickabottom or knee hyperextension looks like. It's a bendward, backward bending of the knee. So what are the causes? Dashboard injury uh, can occur. That's, uh, these happen in industrial situations and motor vehicle accidents where the knee is flexed and, and a blunt force pushes the tibia back up the femur, and that disrupts that posterior cruciate ligament right there. So that can lead to definitely injuries of that PCL, the posterior cruciate, and uh, that can lead to knee hypertension. Uh, the other mechanical cause is excessive ankle dorsiflexion. So if, uh, if somebody's running cross country, for example, their heel ends up in the bottom of a pothole, their forefoot is, is on the top of the pothole, uh, they have excessive ankle dorsiflexion, the toes pointing it up too, too far. Usually that'll take out the Achilles, but for, for whatever reason, if the Achilles remains intact, then the next constraint up the line is the posterior cruciate ligament. And uh, so we see this typically, this type of injury typically in younger populations and more athletic populations. Almost all of the rest of knee hypertension is a result of muscle weakness. Uh, so I already mentioned the quad weakness, weakness that won't accept flexion, the forward bending, the, the muscle knows it's weak, so it's going to inhibit, inhibit the knee from bending forward. And so it's, it makes the knee now predisposed to go into too much extension. So quad weakness is a big deal. Uh, so bending the knee forward and strengthening that muscle a little bit and doing baby squats actually makes uh, pretty good sense. And then the gastrocnemius is the, the calf glute muscle right underneath the skin. There are two major muscles there. And the other one is the soleus uh, right next to the bone. But this guy right here um, is the, the muscle that's supposed to decelerate knee extension moments as they occur. And if this muscle is deficit, there's nothing decelerating knee extension when it's supposed to occur. And now you have uncontrolled knee extension and you start banging on the posterior cruciate ligament back here. At first, there's not much range of motion, but with, with every step a person takes, they bang on that, on that posterior cruciate and, and it gradually progresses and it stretches and it stretches and it stretches and it adaptively lengthens due to that un, undue force on it. And a person ends up with genuine bottom or knee hyperextension. Uh, there can be a rotatory component to knee hyperextension if, there's, uh, if the feet are pointing inward, that usually creates an external rotatory de uh, deformity associated with knee hypertension. Uh, if the feet are pointed outward, that usually creates an internal rotatory influence on the knee. So instead of the knee going just straight back with a non-rotatory knee hypertension, uh, with a rotatory knee hypertension, the knee uh, bends back backward too far and it heads uh, out to the Southwest out here, it heads out. Uh, so uh, that can be a little bit more challenging uh, to control for, for uh, orthotic intervention. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, grades or classifications. Uh, I made up this term several uh, decades ago, pre, pre -week about them. Uh I know any number of people who just generally have lax ligaments. My mom, for example, <clears throat> even her advanced age, she could stand and with her knees locked in extension, reach down and touch the floor with the palms of her hand. She's just really, really flexible. She would stand uh, in a position like this uh, when she just relaxed, she would do what they call hang on the ligaments, uh, resting on the ligaments. Uh, when she walked, her, her gait looked normal. She never uh, put undue stress on the ligaments when she was walking, just when she was statically standing. Uh, so some people have just have this posture when they stand, when they walk, 
the, the gastrocnemia stops the knee when it's supposed to, and they never end up with Greek or bottom. Uh, so that's one condition. Uh, but other than that, um, <clears throat> we see a lot of people who, the, where the gastrocnemius is getting weak, perhaps the quadriceps is getting a little bit weak, and they have that initial pop into knee hyperextension. Um, you can almost picture that in, in your mind, I think, um, where there's an uncontrolled uh, force towards extension. And uh, initially, they may not go much past this. And uh, ideally, that's when we want to catch them. Uh, once somebody's got a 35 degree curve back here, that's a much more challenging situation. Uh, we'll see in a minute, it's a relatively easy, straightforward process to control that real early knee hyperextension moment that occurs when the knee kind of pops into that, that posterior ligament. Uh, so there's pre rick bottom, and then there's, there's mild and, and moderate and severe. Uh, I, I classify anything over 35 degrees or 30 degrees as severe. Um, uh, moderate is probably been this range, 15 to 20 degrees maybe, of breaker bottom. So we'll look at uh, different interventions for the different uh, levels of, uh, of breaker bottom and go from there. So uh, the first intervention is simply the appropriate kind of AFO. If someone does have foot drop, they tend to go into knee hyper extension. Uh, that, that's very clear in the literature. And so we can use a certain type of AFO to get rid of that excessive knee, knee extension moment and keep them in a more neutral posture at their knee during walking. So here's a case, a fairly recent injury. And you see this left leg there, going, you can see the forces driving it into knee hypertension because of the foot drop down here. So the, that foot drop and dysfunction of the calf group is going to create that excessive kind of knee extension moment that you see right there, boom. And that almost hurts to see it. Uh, that was, I would classify that as pre reeker bottom uh, because it's, it's only, it's probably less than five degrees of knee extension, knee hyperextension. And that can be very easily managed with the right kind of AFO. And uh, let me show you that here. Here's the type of AFO. They have a shell in front of the shin bone instead of around the calf group. And so, and they're carbon composites. So they can control what's happening at the knee a lot easier than most AFOs. We use these in conjunction with the heel wedge. This wedge can go underneath the heel, uh, uh, either underneath the heel of the patient or underneath the heel of this foot plate over here. Uh, and you see this one, this particular version uh, comes in three layers. So very often on that early, real early uh, uh, hyperextension moment occurring, we can use just one of these layers. It's about an eighth of an inch thick and uh, put that underneath the foot plate of this carbon composite AFO. And what that does is it takes the posture of the AFO from this neutral posture to this posture, where we add that little bit of wedge here. And you can see the, the, the shell here is pointed a little bit more forward here than it is here. That puts a little bit more flexion influence on the knee. It wants to it makes the knee bend forward a little bit more that delays when the knee bends backwards. And, and very often this is incredibly successful actually in dealing with that real early reek of bottom. So the little wedge here is gonna move this a little bit more forward and, and, uh, and delay when extension occurs at the knee. So here's the, first, the person's very first try in, in uh, walking and uh, that, that type of AFO is getting rid of her, uh, that early knee extension moment. Uh, she still needs some gait training. This is her very first time walking, and it's just in the exam room there. Uh, but she, she, she's much more stable, and um, with a little bit more practice and maybe a little bit of rehab, she should be able to walk completely naturally and, and completely relaxed, and the AFO will keep the knee out of trouble and keep it out of going into that excessive extension moment. So just an AFO can work. Uh, here's another case study where a patient had an ankle fusion. Uh, she was fused into a kind of a foot drop kind of position, you could say. Uh, she uh, started out pain-free with this condition, but then ended up in what she refers to as 11-10 pain, really, really severe pain. I think you'll see that in the video. 
where she's just in excruciating pain walking on that ankle. And that is driving her knee more towards extension. She still has a good calf group. And so her knee isn't, uh, doesn't have an uncontrolled, but there you saw that extension moment. There you see it, boom. So uh, just that little bit of foot drop is gonna tend to drive the knee into that excessive extension moment. So uh, in a situation like this, instead of that little one eighth, little wedge underneath the heel, uh, we, uh, we did that AFO, but we added, actually it was just under a full inch of wedge. And that was underneath the foot plate of the AFO, not underneath her foot. It was underneath the foot plate of the AFO. So her foot ended up in this position. And here we see what she uh, looks like with the AFO. No, no, the other one, the other one, there you go. So um, walking with that, with the AFO, with the wedge, uh, her gait is significantly different. There's no longer that, that knee hyperextension moment occurring. Uh, she's walking at virtually no pain. She's still guarding because there was pain when she walked and she's waiting for that to happen, uh, but she's walking without pain. And, and that's pretty cool. So just an AFO and, and uh, various, sizes, various sized wedges, depending on the situation. Uh, again, anywhere from a 16th of an inch, eighth of an inch to a full inch of wedge, uh, sometimes on top of the foot plate, sometimes underneath the foot plate, uh, can help control that knee extension moment very, very well. And I'm talking about the early uh, or mild knee extension moment. Yeah, she would need continued gait training also, uh, learn how to relax and, and uh, bend her knee forward a little bit more than she is right now. She's still guarded. So um, uh, some gait training would help her definitely. So conclusion, uh, pre bottom can be controlled with an AFO and a wedge if necessary. As far as knee supports themselves, uh, this is referred to as the Swedish knee cage. The Swedes hate that because they didn't develop it. They didn't design it. They didn't invent it. They had nothing to do with it, but it's called the Swedish knee cage and it is terrible. Uh, it has very poor suspension. If someone's anywhere active at all wearing this brace, it tends to end up around a person's ankle instead of their knees. Uh, yeah, it limits knee flexion. So it's very, very difficult to put this on underneath your slacks. Because once it's on, it's almost impossible to get your slacks on. So it limits knee flexion. This big, uh, uh, broad uh, strap back here is going to limit knee flexion. And uh, because it's relatively short, I think it's only 11 inches, it puts a lot of high pressure on soft tissue. So it's very uncomfortable. So if someone, if someone recommends a Swedish knee cage, uh, ask them what plan B is. Uh, you probably don't want a Swedish. Uh, one brace that's much longer, 17 inches instead of 11 inches, is the, the product called the Check. It's from Allard USA. Uh, very intimately fitting. Uh, you can have this on underneath your slacks, and I don't think anyone would know you had it on. So it's very comfortable. It has very good suspension. This strap right here helps make that happen. But there's a strap above the belly of the gastroc, right below the knee. That's the one place on the knee where there's a it's kind of a little bit of a shelf where we can hang a knee brace off of that shelf. So uh, that, it's very good suspension, so, it's, so it stays in place. It's long, so there's a very low, low pressure on soft tissue. And the, uh, the knee strap, uh, the extension stop back here is adjustable. So uh, if someone's in 20 degrees of breaker bottom, uh, we can start the, this out and, and take them just to 10 degrees of breaker bottom. And a few weeks later, we'll take them to five degrees of breaker bottom and go through a gradual functional progression from significant breaker bottom to uh, the knee not going into breaker bottom at all. So um, it's usually better, by the way, to do that in, 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 in sequential steps, as opposed to making one big, huge correction at once. Uh, the body has a memory system that memorizes, uh, it remembers how the body moves. And if we change movement too much, it really screws up the movement memory system. So when we make changes in gait, we try and make them gradually and progressively. So this is a good one for mild to moderate knee hyperextension. Uh, so again, it's 17 inches, so light, lightweight. It comes to aluminum and stainless steel. Aluminum for relatively more mild cases and stainless steel for relatively more moderate situations of knee hyperextension. 
uh, has a, a free axis, a double axis uh, joint in it, uh, independent multi axial joints. So that moves with the motion of the knee, it won't bind knee motion at all. So that's a kind of unique feature. Uh, another brace for this, this mild to moderate classification is the cross. This is like a regular pull on knee sleeve uh, that, that uh, you see very often. Uh, some of these uh, even are in Walmart or whatever. Uh, this one's very specifically designed for knee hyperextension. Uh, it's got a range of motion control joint here. Again, it's relatively shorter. Um, I would use only this brace only on very mild cases of knee hypertension. Uh, if you get into the more moderate ranges, you use that brace with a, one of these carbon composite AFOs. And that's a really cool intervention because it, it helps with the foot drop situation. Uh, so it makes the, the lower quarter more stable, the front ankle complex more stable. Uh, and this, the shell here in the front of the tibia is gonna help control what happens at the knee and the timing. This can be used just as you see here. And we also use this, sometimes we'll have wedges in here to help control what happens at the knee and the timing of that happening at the knee. So uh, designed for uh, the, uh, the range of motion issue, the hy knee hypertension issue. Again, a range of motion control joint. Uh, this little flap closes over all of those pins. And so it's very easy to control that. Uh, but one of the cool things about the design of this one is that it can be put on by a person with just one hand. There's an additional strap that, that, can be, uh, uh, that goes through this little cuff here. And so a person can pull this up with one hand and get it to the point where they can reach it with one hand. Uh, then there's this big cuff here. You can put your whole hand underneath there to pull it up. You don't have to have really good grasp uh, strength in order to pull it up. So it's easy to position on the leg. And, uh, and you end up with a very lightweight uh, device that really can help with knee hypertension issues. Here's a, a young lady, uh, she is hemi involved. Uh, here she is with just the AFO and, and she's outside obviously in, in Colorado or someplace, uh, but she's walking up a slope and that's a fairly significant grade that she's walking. Just walking up a grade tends to increase the knee hyperextension moment. Uh, walking down a grade tends to increase the flexion moment where the knee is, it wants to bend forward. But walking up a, a slope like this tends to increase the knee extension moment. So see what she does with just the AFO on. And you can, still, you can see she still has that knee extension moment. I don't know if they used wedges or not. Um, I wasn't there when they videotaped this. But she's still got a pretty good knee extension moment going on even with the AFO. And you would almost expect that with a person walking up an incline like that. And so here she is with the, uh, with the, uh, with the cross knee brace attached to the AFO. It is now a KFO knee ankle foot orthosis. And you're gonna see it's gonna, it's gonna keep her knee essentially out of knee hypertension. She's keeping it flexed and you'll see her pop in towards knee, knee hyperextension, but the brace stops it from going all the way into knee hypertension and the brace therefore is protecting that posterior cruciate ligament from getting stretched anymore. So uh, let me play that one again. That's keeping flesh, there you saw that little, that little boom, that little pop in towards knee hyperextension. Uh, it's still doing that on occasion, but even when it does it, it's not stretching the posterior cruciate ligament. So her knee hypertension won't develop any more from what it is. Uh, then we get into, so that was mild to moderate situations. This is moderate to severe situations where we use um, relatively sturdy uh, carbon composite AFO plus a custom knee orthosis. Uh, so we have an AFO plus a KO, a knee orthosis. Uh, creating a custom KAF on the ankle foot orthosis. Uh, so it's two pieces. You can actually, um, uh, we'll go through the donning process, but you can actually put this on and have it underneath your clothing. And, and, and a person can do that themselves. They don't need an assistant to do that. Uh, very remarkably, it weighs less than two pounds. Uh, so it's very, very light compared to, tra to traditional KFOs. 
and it is available either aluminum for relatively milder cases or in stainless steel for relatively more significant cases. Uh, very intimate fit, as you can see. Again, you could probably wear this under your slacks and, and uh, not many people would notice that you have it on. And so to put this on, you'd roll up your pant leg and put on the AFO. The AFO is already in the shoe. So you put your shoe on with the AFO in there already. And so now you have the AFO on and now you drop your drawers. I don't know a more delicate way of saying that. You drop your pants uh, down to your ankles. And then the, the knee orthosis, uh, the, the knee part of the brace, uh, attaches into a tab here on the AFO. That straps into place, so that's secure. And uh, then you attach the knee extension stocks. Those are straps. You just click those into place and then pull your pants back up and you now have a knee hyperextension orthosis. Uh, here's a case uh, in the 30 to 35 degree range, you see it there, uh, really significant uh, knee hyperextension. Uh, the right side is also involved, but not as severe. Uh, that left side is, is uh, he's got a really good uh, reefer bottom going. And again, I think that's probably, uh, let me back up. Let me back up, I wanna show you that again. There you see the reefer bottom. That's in the good 30, 35, uh, maybe in the 40 degree range. So obviously inhibiting his mobility and, um, and that's gonna do nothing but get worse because there's nothing stopping the pressure on that posterior cruciate. Every time he takes a step that there's the, the, the posterior cruciate will adaptively lengthen because of that stress. So here he is in the brace we just, this just described, the, the combo. And he's still going into a little bit of reefer bottom. You can see he's walking a lot more stable. A lot more stable to get going into a little bit of reefer bottom yet. And I'm very okay with that for this initial fitting. Uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe six weeks, uh, maybe three months later, they could shorten these straps a little bit here and he wouldn't go into that much reefer bottom. Um, just take another three or four degrees of reefer bottom out of that uh, to keep his knee more in the neutral posture. Uh, a lot of these patients need gait training. Uh, and that, the other thing I don't know is if he has a wedge in there or not, uh, he, might, he might benefit from a wedge. Uh, a lot of patients with this device like this, it is recommended they have gait training uh, because the, the AFO will keep the knee from totally collapsing to the floor. So patients have to learn how to flex their knee, how to bend their knee forward a little bit and rely on this AFO to keep it from collapsing all the way. So they can get a little bit of knee flexion and, and with a, just a little bit of knee flexion, gait becomes a lot smoother. Uh, he's walking pretty much stiff-legged obviously not allowing any knee forward bending at all. So if, if they can be trained to accept the support that this has and, and allow the knee to flex just a little bit, then uh, that makes a world of difference in a patient's gait. When that isn't enough and you're dealing with 35, 45, uh, I've seen a case recent, recently where a person had 90 degrees of knee hyperextension then we get into the molded uh, plastic designs, the, the molded uh, carbon composite designs. Uh, these are heavy, heavy duty braces. Um, and they come in, in a variety of designs, but they all do the same thing. There's a huge calf component, uh, a, a shin component. They all have an AFO built into them, usually holding the ankle at 90. Some are adjustable like this one is, uh, but many of them just fix the, the ankle at 90 like this one. Uh, so um, uh, these are, are heavy duty guys to handle really, really heavy duty tasks. Uh, different joint designs, this is just an offset joint design, um, but many of them have a drop lock uh, or this lever lock, uh, this is relatively newer. The drop lock is designed to keep the knee in extension until a person wants to sit down, then the person has to reach down through their slacks and pull this, this ring up here, the drop lock, pull that up, 
allow the knee to flex to 90 to sit down. So that is the, would be the typical uh, management for the very severe Jenny Eureka bottom uh, situation. Um, so they're custom made with the leg. They take a, either a digital scan or a plaster impression of the leg, <clears throat> and then uh, and fabricate the device. Usually laying up plastic, uh, but some now are are uh, doing some some carbon fiber type stuff. So it's a little bit lighter. Uh, they they shape the these are very heavy duty stainless steel uprights. They shape those to the contour of the leg, uh, then build the plastic around that. <clears throat> Excuse me, made in one piece. So um, uh, if you put this on underneath your slacks, which you probably want to do, then you'll need assistance getting your slacks on um, because you can't bend down that far to, to put them on. So, um, but one piece construction and weight can be an issue, uh, not uncommon for these to run up into the range of seven and a half to eight, eight and a half pounds would be pretty typical. Uh, even the carbon composite ones are probably going to be six to six and a half pounds because a lot of the weight is in this stainless steel upright uh, on both sides. So that's uh, sort of the remedy of last resort for very, very severe knee hyperextension. Um, what's coming? Uh, there's a lot of work being done on exoskeletal robotics. Uh, this looks like a Rube Goldberg's invention. Uh, but there, the knee does incredible things uh, to get a robotic knee to, uh, to fit to the outside of the knee and make it function more like a normal knee. It's going to take an incredible amount of artificial, artificial intelligence and robotics to get the knee to do what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it. So a lot of research going on on this by some major uh, corporations. Honda is very involved. Honda Motor Company is, is very involved in, in robotics like this. So um, we're hoping that uh, in not the too distant future, some of this stuff will be available. Um, we don't know what the cost will be. Uh, yeah, that's almost shudder to think about that. But uh, there is research being done. The, the need is, is appreciated. And so uh, that's pretty cool that people appreciate the need. And putting a knee brace on, just really basic. Um, uh, if you're fitting a KAFO, knee ankle foot orthosis, uh, you don't have to worry about this because the position of the knee joint on the, on the knee will be determined by uh, the AFO. And so this is just in the case if you're wearing just the uh, knee orthosis alone without an AFO, just put it on an inch too high uh, because you're fitting on, on your own soft tissue and it's going to seat down as you stand up and take a couple of steps. And you want the, the joint to be relatively in line with the kneecap or the patella. In order for it to end up here, you have to fit it about an inch too high because it will seat on that on your soft tissue. Uh, and then try and position it about two thirds to the posterior if you can. That will align the orthotic joint to the anatomical joint that you see in the dotted lines here. So we would try and align uh, the orthotic joint to the anatomical joint. And then the orthotic joint moves with the anatomical joint and the brace can be a whole lot more comfortable. If the brace is too low, which we usually see, uh, that makes the brace a lot less comfortable and a lot less functional. So with that, uh, we looked at some data. There isn't much, the anatomy, uh, some causes, mostly uh, it can be the quadriceps, it can be the anterior cruciate, but mostly the posterior cruciate and the gastrocnemius are the primary causes for knee hyperextension. And we looked at any number of levels of conditions or supports. With that, thank you all for being here. Uh, I think we got a pretty good crowd today. Uh, so thank you for your attention. For, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, June, for all the work that you do. Uh, thank you, Beth Deloria. She's uh, our, our outreach manager and she's on the road constantly uh, doing promotional events uh, to help people know that they can get back up today and do more than they perhaps thought they could. Uh, Justy Apple with, with Allard. Uh, Dr. Apple is really supportive of all of this. So, so thank you, Justy. And uh, there's my content information. There's my primary role in life right now. Uh, I'm in Central Florida to, to be with some grandkids. That's pretty cool for me. And so um, I'm going to walk out and turn this back over to um, to June. Yes. And well, thank we'll you. Questions.
Yes, we have a lot of questions. Um, so one question here uh, is you mentioned uh, these little mini squat exercises to yes. strengthen the quads. Are there other exercises that you would recommend for that? There are some things you can do with, with TheraBand or stretch the stretch with sport cord, for example, uh, where you can affix that into a door frame or something, make sure that's secure, but have it go around the back of your knee. Uh, uh, and then so, so that the, this TheraBand is pulling your knee into to bending forward. And then you can strengthen some muscles by trying to, to stretch that TheraBand and make your knee go, go towards extension. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that will help your knee accept flexion a little bit easier. And, and it may avoid uh, the knee going into knee hypertension at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the opposite of that is have just turn around 180 and have the there, the sport band uh, pull your knee towards extension, and then you can do your baby squats and, and bend the knee into flexion against some resistance. And, and so that might help a little bit. When you're doing the baby squats and doing these stand-up kind of exercises, the other muscle that it's getting a little bit are the hip extensors and hip flexors. Uh, so it's not just mm -hmm. knee muscles that are involved in this, in this condition. Uh, if, if the muscles, the hip flexors and hip extensors are really weak, uh, they will contribute to the knee not being able to accept flexion and uh, can contribute to the knee going into knee hyperextension. So, so doing these stand-up exercises, the baby squats and using the TheraBand uh, can help strengthen not only the quadriceps and the gastrocnemius, but also the hip flexors and extensors. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, a question regarding the progressive training and um, adjustment of the angle, I guess. Uh, yes. Uh, how many days between adjustments? That's the question. Generally, I go anywhere from three to six weeks, depending on how the patient's tolerating it. So you have to be uh, patient. <laughs> yeah. Movement, yes. movement memory is an amazing thing. Uh, people talk about muscle memory. Their muscles don't have memory, but there's an incredible movement memory uh, when, when we're children, uh, when children start walking, uh, they walk until they're six to seven years old before they have fully reproducible gait. In other words, there's lots of variations going on until that movement is, is set in their mind, in their brain. And, and that takes from a year to, I mean, from year one to year six, there's five years of walking to program this computer up here to say, to, to, for it to memorize our, our normal movement. So uh, it's a very powerful instrument in walking. Uh, if someone's at 20 degrees of rear bottom, um, we can take them easily through orthotic management to neutral, uh, but patients generally hate it. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they hate the brace, they don't like it, they're just not comfortable, it just feels so weird to them. And a big part of that is movement memory. So if they're in 20 degrees of rear bottom, if we take them to maybe, 12 or maybe even 10, uh, reduce it in half and let them get acclimated to that a little bit and, and then take it to five. And so you go in these gradual incremental steps, uh, patients usually accept the brace better and they end up with better results overall, but it, it takes longer to get there, obviously. Okay, great, um, well, that's really, that's an important point, I guess. Yep. Um, there's a question here, are these braces helpful um, for walking for improving walking or is it just to protect the knee from hyperextension? They can help improve walking if the patient can, and this may take uh, professional gait training, if the patient can begin to flex their knee a little bit, bend it forward with walking. In other words, and that, that's probably not gonna come real natural because the muscles are weak, they're inhibiting the knee from going in, from bending forward, from going into flexion. And, but it, if a patient is taught, goes through gait training, and learns how to kind of rest their shin bone into this, into this carbon composite AFO that, that is, is in front of their shin bone, they can just kind of rest into that and allow their knee to bend just a little bit. Gait becomes much more normal as opposed to walking stiff-legged. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. 
So question, is it possible to drive a car while wearing these knee AFOs? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Right foot or left foot? Yes, definitely. Great, they thank you. Uh, they don't immobilize the foot ankle uh, at all. Uh, they support the function of the foot ankle complex, but they don't immobilize. So yes. There's a question asking if, uh, if this puts more stress on the hip joint. Very, very good question. Um, that's why I mentioned the hip muscles earlier. There's a definite linkage there, obviously. Uh, does it put more stress on? I think going into knee hyperextension puts a huge amount of hip extension stress um, on the hip. So keeping the hip in a more neutral range of motion, uh, I think it should not add more stress at all. Okay, great. Um, there's a question. A question here. Um, someone's searching for Allard braces online, but they don't see a way to order them online. What is the best way to get these braces? The best way to get these braces is to just call Allard, call their 800 number, uh, let them know that you're a patient and you're looking for a provider in your area. And so Allard can look through the records who, who has who's their best customer in your area, who's the second best customer, whatever. They'll give you the top two or three customers in your area who use these products or are accustomed to using them. And uh, they'll give you some reference as to the, the uh, orthotic uh, prosthetic facility that a person can go to. Right. Also, what you're, from what you're describing, this is not something that arrives via Amazon. You put it on at home and you're done, right? It sounds like it takes... Uh, in, professional there, fitting and there, training and yes there there are carbon composite afos that you can get on amazon or through uh, ebay or whatever uh Allard has really stayed away from that uh there's they have a, a fairly complex eight step process in fitting these devices and that includes the, the wedging we talked about that takes uh, some expertise to figure out how much of a wedge to use and where to put it in order to help this this rico bottom situation so um, it's not something that, that you would order off of Amazon and put in your shoe and say, this is gonna make it work. Uh, that usually doesn't work. So we rely on the, the uh, certified orthodist uh, in, in the communities. And uh, we, we, Ellard goes through a huge effort to get them trained in different seminars and different conventions and stuff. We, we do independent uh, education programs for the orthodist just to get them geared into the process of making these things work to their optimum, the best that they can. Yep. Right. There's a question about the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a custom device and uh, do you require a, uh, a script, I guess, a prescription? Usually a prescription is required primarily to get reimbursed, to get reimbursement. Mm -hmm. um, most insurance companies, Medicare, uh, all cover this device. Um, the, the cost of the device, is in the same relative power part as a custom molded plastic AFO uh, within a hundred bucks. So the well, price follow, isn't that. Okay. Yeah. There's but a it question. Is a, it is a prefabricated device. Okay. I see. Okay. Um, there's a question about the general cost of these types of devices. And I don't know if you are familiar with the situation in the UK. Like if you were a patient in the UK, what would where would one start? Uh, in the UK, these are covered by National Health Service. And uh, so uh, there's an Allard UK, uh, in the UK, obviously. And uh, they work with National Health Service and uh, it is absolutely available in the UK and it shouldn't cost the patient a penny. Okay, great, thank you. Here's a question. If we go to an orthotist, um, how can we have confidence that they're giving kind of objective professional information as as opposed to just directing you to the product that's most lucrative to that <laughs> practitioner. <laughs> yeah. That is a huge issue and there's so much information available online right now. Um, Allard has, has built the reputation on outcomes. Um, so we have the policy, Allard has a policy that a patient gets to try a product for 30 days if it doesn't work for that patient, the orthodist can send the product back and get reimbursed for it. So uh, on any of these products, 
they have a kit they'll send out for the, the combo, this last brace we talked about. Um, they'll send that out and, and have the patient put it on and wear it for a couple of days. If it works, they can fine tune it and, and get one for that patient. If it doesn't work uh, to expectations, they'll send it back and there will be a charge for that. So there's such variations between, between patients. Uh, it's hard to make blanket, blanket statements, but the one blanket statement we can make is that if it doesn't work, send it back and it won't cost you anything. Uh, there is a question or a question here or sort of comment. She was uh, someone who's told by her physical therapist that I should not wear a knee brace as it would encourage my knee to weaken and become dependent on bracing. That's, um, yeah, we could talk about that for the next hour, I think. Um, If there's a weakness in the knee and there's an in inhibition in the knee where the muscles aren't firing when they should or as strongly as they should, uh, the knee knows that the knee's really smart. So uh, if we put a brace on, will it make the knee weaker? Uh, a brace can't make the, the body weaker or stronger. A brace just can't do that. What a brace can do uh, is impact how active a person is. So if a person's wearing a brace, and they're more active than they were without the brace, there's a good chance those muscles are actually getting stronger. If the person wears the brace and they're less active or, or that doesn't change their level of activity, they're gonna to continue to get weaker. Mm -hmm. So the, the brace can't make muscles get stronger or weaker. The brace can only impact the, the level of activity of that patient. Right. If, the, if the brace can help them be more active, then actually the muscles will get stronger. Right. And it also sounds like, you know, one should be exercising in, in addition to just the everyday use that there may exactly. be exercises that one exactly. should be doing. And there's a comment in the chat area, because I think a lot of people, if they're starting to experience leg weakness, worry about their balance, they worry about falling. So how do you exercise while keeping yourself safe? Oh, yeah, and good. <laughs> so one good. person suggests she, she actually does her exercises in the pool, if you have access Wonderful. to a pool. Wonderful. And that lowers you have access to the pool. That's great. Yeah. Uh, but even a, a fairly sturdy chair, if you stand in front of it or have chairs on either side of you, um, probably no one has the parallel bars in their in their home. Uh, but that's the idea. Have something that you, that you know, will support you. Uh, if you're doing these little, even the little baby knee squats, uh, if uh, I, I want a chair in front of me, I think that in case uh, I exceed the limits of my need to be able to handle that stress, if they do start to collapse, I'm gonna grab on something. So safety is really mandatory for anything that we do, uh, uh, trying to work with muscles that have some deficit. Are there yeah. exercises one can do while seated that will strengthen those quadricep muscles? There's some controversy about that. Um, in other words, a person can be seated and put a five pound wrapper on their ankle and then extend their, their knee and swing their foot through space kind of thing. Um, that can strengthen the quadriceps, uh, but it doesn't impact the movement memory system that we talked about earlier. Uh, so if the quadriceps now are stronger, now that they stand up, they won't have any better sense of when to fire than they did before they got stronger. So in order for them to have this, the sense that they know what to do and when to do it, uh, for that to happen, the exercise has to be weight bearing because that's why the baby squat is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, a... I don't, I'm not saying don't do it. Uh, I'm saying uh, don't, don't get too optimistic about how well this is gonna help you. Okay, good. There's a comment here or question uh, she was diagnosed 15 years ago with foot drop went through various braces custom afos that caused a lot of rubbing and blisters mm. uh, she found it much better to wear a wedge shoe with at least a 2.25 wedge height and thin sole uh, she's able to walk two to three miles without any as other assistance now however she's experiencing some of the hyperextension knee pain Yep. Will wearing a wedge shoe cause more issues for her down the road? Nope. 
Nope, wearing a wedge shoe will not cause more issues. Um, uh, but uh, she's gonna uh, wearing a wedge. Wearing a wedge shoe was a beautiful idea, by the way. I love that idea. Uh, I put people in cowboy boots, uh, or, or yeah, just to raise their whole body up, and that that helps the knee function better and uh, up to a point. And, and then um, uh, once the quadriceps get weak, and once the gastroc, I mean, the, yeah, the gastrocnemius becomes weak, uh, then the wedge doesn't help so much. And then she's probably going to need that support of that carbon composite in front of her tibia, uh, mm -hmm. in front of her shin bone, so that she can sort of lean into that and, and uh, get the support that she needs for her knee. Here's a comment from Kathy. She says, you know, the, the much maligned <laughs> Swedish knee brace, she finds that uh, it's helpful for taking showers in short term. Um, Beautiful. So, yeah, limited use. Right to help with the hyperextension of her yep. knee. Thank you, um, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're just about at the end of our time, but we have another yeah. question. Are you yourself seeing patients at, a, at your clinic in Central Florida? I do not, I do not. Okay. Uh, I have some people I work with around this area, uh, but I do not. Okay, so. but if somebody would like a referral, they can get in touch with you. Get in touch with me and okay. I'll help them find someone who knows what they're doing. Yep. Okay, very good. Um, oh, let's see. There is another question. It says not to do with knee hyperextension, but to switch topics altogether. Uh, he said one of his issues is weakened paraspinal muscles that make it impossible to stand upright. Are you aware of any orthotic device that can help? Oh, there are a lot, um, and but it's another, another one of those situations. There are a lot of products out there prefabricated. There are a lot of things that can, can be done on a, on a custom orthotic basis, uh, but it's, it's really assessing the patient, uh, assessing their strength, as, assessing their functional needs, what they want to do, and then trying to come up with the best solution. Uh, you're going to have a tough time going to Amazon and doing that. Right. So I would just recommend a, a good uh, uh, orthotist who does a lot of spine work, uh, familiar with all the all the options that are available. Um, a lot of them, I think most orthotists will be glad to fit a prefabricated if that's the best solution. Uh, there's some good ones out there, uh, but if a custom is needed, then uh, they know that too. So. All right, well, we are totally out of time, but oh. thank you so much, Bob. This was just so informative and I hope our audience uh, uh -huh. uh, benefited from this. And thank you all. I'm gonna bring back Beth to say some parting words. Cool. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for attending our FSHD University webinar today. Very special thank you to Mr. Bob Meyer. Yes. Very, very helpful information. My husband um, has hyper knee extension, so I was very focused on, on what you were saying today. Great, <laughs> great advice. Thank you so much cool. for answering all of our questions. You're Appreciate welcome. it very much. Um, our next FSHD webinar isn't until next year on January 27th. It sounds so far away, but it's really not. But our topic is, is um, therapy for shoulder dyskinesia, which um, many of us FSHDers have. And our speaker is um, from the Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands. So please join us for that webinar next year. And of course, check our website event calendar for all the upcoming chapter and wellness and educational events that we have. And thank you for joining us today. And we, we wish you all a very, very happy holiday season. So thanks again and see you next year. Thanks Beth, <laughs> bye-bye. Bye everybody. Bye.